George uh, Velastianos is, I'm, I'm just going to read this to you so, so that I get everything right, is a um, Canada Research Chair in Innovative Learning and Technology and Associate Professor at Royal Roads University in British uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada. Uh, he studies emerging technologies and pedagogies, and his research aims to understand learners, educators, and scholars' practices and experiences in emerging online settings, such as social networks and open learning environments. He's published uh, two books and more than 40 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts and book chapters, and has given lots and lots of talks all over the world. Um, uh, he's been designing and developing and studying online and hybrid learning environments um, for a long time. Great. <laughs> Since 2004. Awesome. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks for uh, sticking around. Um, as I said, I'm going to take about half an hour to talk about this work. Um, initially, it was planned like that, so we could have half an hour to chat. Um, but I understand that if you're going to rush out after this, that's absolutely fine, too. But uh, I hope to mesmerize you with my research. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but uh, I'm going to do my best. So um, <laughs> I love talking about my research at these events because uh, it doesn't get to come out in print until you know two years down the road. And most of the times when that happens, it's kind of out of date. So this is a great ex um, opportunity to share about it while it's you know relevant and it might make some, some difference. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about me personally, just to start with. Um, I grew up in Cyprus, which is uh, right there, um, south of Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea. And, um, and Cyprus looks like this in the summer. It actually looks like that in the winter, too. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, um, <laughs> back to summer. Um, <laughs> But I haven't been there for a while, so you know it's uh, um, I, I see it from the pictures too. Um, but now I'm on a different island. I'm on Vancouver Island. I live in Victoria, which is where um, my university is. Uh, it's about 20 miles north of Port Angeles. It's like an hour um, an hour long ferry ride from Washington State. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about Royal Roads um, because. Um, it illustrates some things about contemporary universities, and it, um, it reveals some sort of a, a myth that we have about universities, and talking about this university helped me uh, illustrate that. So Royal Roads was created in 1985. Don't let the castle fool you. The castle has been there before 1985. Um, before that, the university was a military academy, uh, but it was set up in 1985. Uh, by a, a provincial uh, kind of directive, and the idea was to offer graduate level degrees, flexible graduate level degrees, to uh, working professionals who were not able to, you know, pause their life and go uh, spend their time at a university like a regular, you know, um, residential university, right? And over time, um, you know, the university learned a lot, it grew. Um, it, it now has a social learning model, which essentially means that um, ideas from uh, social learning theory are integrated throughout our courses and so on. Um, so in these 20 years that the university has been in existence, 20? 30. <laughs> it's not a teenager anymore. Uh, so in these years, um, the university has changed, right? Um, and the, the story that we often hear is that Universities has, have been unchanged since the dawn of time, right? There's people sitting at uh, some towers somewhere, and the universities are divorced from society. Uh, but both this story shows, and, and the research that's um, out there that I have read, show that universities over time change and reflect the societies that house them. So this university was set up to uh, address the needs of working professionals, right? Um, university of Southern New Hampshire um, was set up uh, and changed over time and now offers um, competency-based degrees. Um, the University of Phoenix came around and they offer some type of product and other universities are learning from or not learning some of the practices that they were engaging in, right? So over time, the argument says that uh, universities actually reflect the societies that house them. So as our society is facing um, 
issues like economic downturns, technological innovations, uh, rise of certain political parties, then our universities are changing to reflect those changes. All right, so what does that mean? Um, that means like that um, institutions, um, as they're changing and as they're exploring different ways to offer degrees or different um, or engage in different pedagogies, we're finding ourselves in emerging situations. And emerging situations are situations in which we try things out that we don't necessarily know much about. So, for example, um, the whole MOOC idea, right? It came up um, as as a, as a learning model. People were trying it out, uh, it changed, um, they tried out some things, um, and so on. So there's not much research out there uh, when some of these ideas are being tried out to really guide us. We can look at um, other things that came before them, uh, but we're slowly catching up to that. Uh, the, same, the same about, um, about openness. Um, I know that David is collecting um, you know, a lot of the research around openness to kind of make sense of what it is that you know, the scholarly community knows about, um, about the benefits, about uh, people's perceptions of that practice. But it still is a relatively new practice, right, with not much empirical work around it. Or, um, or there is empirical work about, around it, but we haven't gathered it and made uh, complete sense of it yet. So that's kind of where, that's kind of the space that um, I investigate. So I try to uh, make sense of these practices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share five things that we have found from our uh, research. And uh, for each finding, I'm going to explain kind of the significance of the, of the implications. Okay, so finding number one. Um, there's a university, let's call it Institution X, at which um, there's an absence of open policies. And you know, this institution is probably, uh, you know, a lot of universities are like this one, right? Um, some institutions have policies around openness, uh, open access policies, for example. Um, some institutions have um, more broad policies than others. But in this institution, there's a general lack, complete lack of open policies, right? No one tells faculty members, oh, you should you know, publish in open access journals. Um, there's no incentives, institutionally speaking. Um, so, what, um, so what I tried to do, um, I essentially did a case study of this institution and went and explored every single individual faculty member's online presence to see if there was any evidence of practices that they were engaging in that were open. So for example, um, Alex, right? Let's say Alex was at the institution. I would essentially stalk her online um, <laughs> and check up on her work and see if any of the products that she had posted online um, had open licenses attached to them. And you know, there was a systematic process to go through this, right? So search Google Scholar, check out the first 100 results, check Google, um, again, the first 100 results, make sure that the Alex that I'm seeing is the Alex that I wanna look at, and examine every single artifact to see if they're open policies. So, um, after spending way too much time to do that, um, <laughs> we observed that the majority of the faculty members there were uh, publishing manuscript in open ways. They were creating open educational resources and sharing them and offering opportunities for open learning. And that last one essentially means either publishing open materials or um, teaching MOOCs or teaching a course that's not necessarily massive, but it was open in some sort of way. Um, so in the words of uh, Martin Weller, um, Open is one. There's a number of academics, at least at this institution, and again, this is just one single institution, right? Um, that engage in these open practices without necessarily prompt by the institution. Um, some of the implications that we drew from this work 
is that there's uh, individual rather than systemic motivators that appear to drive um, some of these practices. We saw that some practices are more privileged than others. For example, uh, we found no evidence of an individual publishing their data in an open way. Um, and then the last thing that we found is um, what I like to call the tyranny of default settings. And then today I realized that other people have um, coined that term too. And it goes, to, it goes to show you, right? You come up with something interesting, then you search online, and then you figure out, well, someone else said it already. So anyway, <laughs> but the idea there is that we found a lot of people um, posting materials either on their website uh, or on YouTube that had no uh, open licenses attached to them. And in particular on YouTube, what we saw was that all of those materials had the default license that YouTube um, assigned to that material, which basically gives YouTube the ability to share that and the user the ability to view that, right? So, um, so that is the, kind of the, the idea that the default setting is powerful and, um, and needs to be questioned. Um, our second finding comes from um, a large study that we just um, were finishing up. But the idea is that uh, research on online education or online learning is becoming more and more interdisciplinary. And this is not uh, profound in any sort of way, but, and we're still figuring out the details. But we try to examine the empirical literature that has been published in, uh, in massive open online courses in 2003 and 2004. And we identified 180 papers that were written on the topic that involved some sort of a data analysis, right? Um, and then we looked at the affiliation of every individual author that was on those papers. There were about 800 authors. Um, and we tried to see whether the disciplinary participation changed from years before 2003 and then after 2003. So we, we had a different sample of data from the early MOOCs from uh, 2008 to 2012 that essentially um, showed that there were about 50 papers that were written on MOOCs at the time and then our sample. So we compared the two samples our statistics said these two samples are different. And then we said, OK, well, they are different, but what does that mean? Um, by comparing the disciplinary kind of makeup of that sample, uh, we saw that there's more interdisciplinary uh, participation in the later sample. So there's more computer scientists participating in uh, writing about online education. Uh, there's more um, engineering and independent researchers writing about it, and there's more industry folks writing about uh, online education. So what does that really mean? Um, oh, how confident are we in this result? We're very confident because we repeated this analysis 10,000 times and it came up being the same, the same result over and over. Um, but what does that mean? Um, this, we believe, is a positive trend, but it presents both an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is that it allows us to uh, you know, learn from each other and use the different abilities of the different disciplines to truly study online learning and understand it. Uh, the, the challenge is that we come at studying um, online education with our, uh, with our um, a priori assumptions. So in the cases, for example, where we saw that there were a lot of computer scientists involved in studying online education, the research methods used were usually from that discipline. So things like um, data mining, clickstream analytics, uh, learning analytics types of things, right? So um, to truly come together to understand um, online learning, we, we essentially suggest that there needs to be a diversity in the methods that need to be used to that study. And this connects well with this third finding. And I'm going to let you read that, uh, that quote up there uh, for a couple of seconds, or that claim.
So we talked a little bit today about learning analytics and um, and this disclaimer right here uh, encapsulates kind of the um, the rising perspective in the field that we can understand learning by capturing and analyzing the data trails that our students are leaving behind, right? Um, and this is what Canon was uh, talking a little bit ago when she said that to design learning activities that our aim should be to design learning activities that collect data to make learning visible. Um, so we've been seeing this increasing desire to collect, mine, and analyze data trails. And, uh, and we believe that this practice is kind of a broader reflection of society, of, uh, of a societal trend. Um, again, kind of mentioned um, Netflix, Amazon, right? There is an increasing desire to capture that data and make sense of what people are doing online. So a couple of things that researchers have discovered, for example, by doing this type of work is that students, again, this is in the context of MOOCs, students generally stop watching online videos after four or five minutes, right? Which then leads to kind of a design decision to create videos that are four to five minutes, right? Makes sense. Um, something else is that students tend to fall into discrete categories of participation. So you have people who are engaging with the content and they're keeping on pace with the course. And you have people that stop after a couple of weeks of participation and so on. So that leads people to design different interventions for different groups of people, right? So if you observe that someone is starting to trail off on the second week, then you can you know, send a motivational message, automated of course, um, to help those people come in, right? So these are the types of um, studies that we're seeing more and more. Um, let's see, you got things like this, right? It's a, this is a social network visualization of my LinkedIn um, group, I suppose, and they're colored in different ways. So like the orange group right there is people that I went to college with, right? And they're, um, and the group at, at down below is from, uh, from Victoria and so on. Uh, but not only that, we're also seeing increasing calls to share uh, data. So this is a call from a journal um, asking for individuals to contribute their data so that uh, others analyze them. Again, Ken mentioned about that. This one came up uh, yesterday. Um, share your data sets and your descriptions for other people to analyze and make sense. Um, but we're also seeing this in, um, in other places. Have you guys seen this? Okay, so this popped up in my Facebook the other day. But um, so the idea here is to, the question here was, can I tell your personality and various characteristics about you by looking at what you like on Facebook? Um, and uh, this research group developed an algorithm that uh, looks at your Facebook likes and then makes inferences about you, right? So I tried it out. Um, and you know, you log in and whatnot, and then, and then it gives you kind of a sense, okay, I think you're 45% male. And <laughs> 27, I like the 27 part. Um, but it was really interesting, right? I mean, this comes from um, psychological research that says that your colleagues and your friends and your family um, can pretty much predict uh, things about you. Uh, but because they're so close to you, they depend on uh, incomplete information or information that they just remember. But if you're on Facebook and you're participating, you keep a record of you know, the things that you express that you like. So the idea is that an algorithm can tell more about you because it's not biased, right? So, so that, that's where that come in, comes in. So how does that relate to um, online learning? Um, can we fully understand uh, online education and participation by looking at the data trails that people leave behind, by doing data science, um, by making everyone's practice, participation, learning more visible, right? Um, and our argument in our paper is that while these things can, exp can help us understand what people do, right? Spend X time on this, watch this video five times, um, 
asked a number of questions on the discussion board. These methods don't necessarily tell us why people do the things that they do, and they don't necessarily tell us um, how they actually experience uh, online education and the designs that we create for them. So in our work, we try to explain the how people experience it and the why they do the things that they do. I'm going to talk about those next. Um, however, learning analytics is really powerful. Um, so there's an alternative perspective to consider. And I found this video the other day I'm going to play for you that uh, kind of pokes fun at Facebook, but I think reveals something similar here. It's, uh, it's a little song. I stayed up till 5 a.m. again. Fluffle, 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 Facebook stalking my more successful friends. Jack's got a house, Jane's in Tangier. I made $11,000 last year. My timeline's dead year round, except my birthday. Just got repossessed, changed the jail in Tangier For writing fake checks, HBO got Zach Braff And fired for Jeff They all make you look like they're living the dream Nobody's life is as cool as it seems Alright, so, so that's the idea, right? That parts of it can be refined, but other parts are invisible and require different strategies So our next finding that talks about this is um, we have, we completed one project and we're now in the middle of a different project where we reach out to individuals who are taking MOOCs and we're interviewing them about, about what is, it's like. Um, and one of the things that we, we found that might not necessarily be uh, too big of a surprise for you is that um, learners schedule their learning, their use of resources and their participation uh, to fit um, the realities of their life. So this is in stark contrast to the idea that um, you know, education is situated at the university and happening at particular time periods. So for example, here's one story. One individual that we interviewed at, that we interviewed, um, works on uh, his class uh, every day early in the morning. Right? And if you look at the uh, learning, uh, learning analytics data that um, that we have looked at for this individual, you'll see that every morning he goes there, he sits for an hour, does X, Y, Z, and stops and then does the next thing. But why does he do that? The reason that he does that is that um, his daughter is homeschooled, so once she wakes up, she needs access to the one computer that they have at home uh, to work on her, um, on her schooling, right? So, uh, so in that case, it becomes an issue of, uh, of resources and, uh, and sharing uh, those resources. Uh, two new mothers that we interviewed um, described how they would watch videos in between uh, feeding their children. So they had to participate in the course um, in chunks of 30 or 45 minutes long. Again, they were fitting um, their use of the course in the time period that they had um, to, to make it happen. All right, so the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about is this idea of, uh, of note-taking. So to date, uh, MOOC platforms um, have not provided um, any sort of uh, tool for a student to take notes. Coursera has started doing something um, very recently, but um, it's something that's not supported on the platform. And what happens is that if something is not supported on the platform and you're only looking at platform data, you would completely miss this, right? Even though, again, it's nothing profound. Like, students take notes, right? Um, so students take note, notes on paper that they share, the students that we talk to um, take notes on paper that they share with colleagues and friends and husbands and loved ones. Um, but they also take notes digitally. 
Um, they, um, they take notes on Word documents. They take notes uh, on blogs and so on. So I think this has really interesting implications for learning analytics data, right? Because one could argue, well, we should make this visible, right? We should pr provide a space for students to take notes, uh, maybe associated with the videos. Um, but we should provide those affordances, right? It's not something that's technically difficult. Um, and then we can analyze that and maybe we can support them. Maybe we can figure out misconceptions by mining their notes. Maybe we can do X, Y, Z again with this argument of making learning more visible. Um, but what we're worried about is that when some of these things happen, then they get to, they tend to get closed down within platforms, right? Coursera will create their own um, note-taking tool, um, but you wouldn't be able to export your note to other platforms, right? So the suggestion here that we made is that um, if designers and developers decide to implement some of these things, what they should really do is that they should build them on, um, on tools that are interoperable. So for example, something that would allow students to download their notes from one platform and take them to the other uh, that would allow individuals to own uh, the work that they do. Uh, a lot of the students that we talk to take similar courses between uh, platforms. So they might take you know, um, Biology 101 and bi on Coursera and Biology 102 on edX. And they usually use the notes from the two um, in the different courses. So enabling them to transfer courses between, to transfer notes between courses is going to be helpful. Um, we're not too hopeful about that, but you know, sharing, I think that good message and, um, and explaining to people that students do this to support their learning, uh, we're hoping that that would um, convince companies to develop some of these tools that allow interoperability uh, between platforms. All right, so to summarize, um, let's see. We have open practices enacted um, in the case studies that we have looked at for individual reasons as opposed to some systemic um, motivators or factors. We've looked at interdisciplinarity and how that is becoming more um, pervasive. Um, note taking, I'm forgetting. Um, online learning accommodating lives as opposed to the other way around and an excitement about learning analytics and data, data everywhere. So those are the kind of five things that we are seeing and, and finding in our courses. So I'm going to end it there and, uh, and that was 28 minutes. So that was great. <laughs> um, These slides are going to be on SlideShare, so you can grab them, and that's my blog where I rant about some of these things. Um, if you have any questions, either on the methods or the limitations or whatever, or anything, just feel free to ask. Any questions for George? Uh, on the note-taking thing, because you know, we had noticed that as well as all these commercial companies, they don't want them to take notes or copy things. We were implementing ebooks at my last place, but it was really hard for students to take notes yeah. um, because they were trying to guard their digital rights or whatever. So we, I, this is an idea, I guess, is we had students use Evernote and because it was BYOD, they could t take notes as they read, they could email it to each other, they could capture lectures through audio or photo, take photos of things. And I mean, so I'm just sort of wondering, like, what's your idea on that is just kind of mashing up tools to, to make it work. Yeah. Um, so I take a pragmatic stance on a lot of these things. So my, you know, companies might develop their own platforms, but as far as I'm concerned, um, we should be supporting students in, um, getting the most out of their note taking regardless of where it is, right? So if I would, you know, if, plat if there's some sort of tool built into the platform, my hope would be that that would be open or at least the data would be open to be able to be moved into a different platform. Um, but one of our other suggestions is for uh, instructors to kind of scaffold that note taking process into supporting students in taking notes 
that would be that would be helpful um, to them in the future. Any other questions for George? So I was take I was taking a, a an open edX course last night right before poker, and I don't um, know what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, I did something with my hand and the long, really articulate, insightful paragraph that I had been writing um, went away. So it doesn't have auto save. It's very, very frustrating. I don't know why I just thought of that. But anyway. So that thank you very much, George. And, um, You're welcome. Really appreciate it. You're going to be here for dinner. Yeah? Okay, so we can have dinner with George. Um, about um, uh, dinner, I, um, since we were running a little bit late, we moved dinner uh, to 7 o'clock, so we have a little bit of a break between now and dinner time. We do have dinner here for everyone. We will be um, having our awards, and there is a surprise uh, at dinner also, so I hope to see you all there. Um, uh, <laughs> say that again? What's the surprise? Well, if I told you, then <laughs> it's a good one. It's a very good one. Um, 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 thinking on the fly. You'll like it. It's very cool. It has to do with one of the presentations here today. Um, so uh, I did want to give you a brief little preview of tomorrow. Is Joseph here still? He was here a second ago. Joseph South is, uh, is here. Tomorrow's kind of like policy day. We have three people from Washington coming. Um, we have Chris Murray, a lobbyist, uh, um, a, a higher education lobbyist. We have uh, George, Joseph South, who's from the Department of Education. And we have Marshall Hill, who is um, the uh, Chief Executive Officer of SARA, the State Auth Authorization um, main guy. Um, um, it's late. <laughs> Say it again. Oh, and I forgot, and Chancellor Zipfer is coming. Um, first thing in the morning, she will be here uh, to say hello to all of us. So we need to be here bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at 9 a.m. Um, and we still have lots of fun uh, to have with dinner and, um, and with whatever we want to do after dinner. Um, and so I, I thank you for the day. Thank you for, uh, for being here. And I'll see you at dinner and then again tomorrow. Dinners again in the ballroom, yes. Thank you, George, and thanks to all of the presenters and to everyone who tuned in online. Thank you. See you tomorrow.